And uh, I guess you can be very thankful that uh, you don't just have one, but you've got two. Isn't that something? And you got one that uh, you might as well enjoy. It's all we've ever had. It's all American Church hymnal. Uh, but these things are, as time goes on, they're no longer in print. We bought 500, I think, the last time, because uh, it's or a couple hundred. Anyhow, uh, it's the last shot through with the All-American Church hymnal. Uh, but these days, you know, they go to church. They don't need a Bible. Everything's put on the wall for them. They don't need a songbook. It's on the wall. You can be thankful uh, that you got somebody standing up here and saying, take your gray songbook, take your red songbook, and uh, sing the good old songs, the sweet songs of Zion, nothing like it. The old-time Methodists, uh, they felt like all you need is two books, you know. You need the hymn book, and you need the hymn book. That's all you need to make it through life. And uh, these kind of things, they're just kind of, you know, for people like me, I never use them. I uh, was cleaning off my desk, like I'm always told, do for Bruce MacDowell comes. And uh, so I found some of these things, 2003, I didn't have one entry in them. <laughs> so uh, when I say I'm a shirt pocket type of a guy, I guess that's pretty much how I am, and I think you know that. Uh, also now the offering as usual uh, do it the same way we've always done it if you can you make sure you save a few bucks and stick it in the mission side of the offering uh, sometime between now and Sunday night for Brother MacDowell's love offering uh, also visitors we're appreciative of you being here and uh, try your best also to bring more through uh, if you would do some praying and ask God to put somebody on your heart and try to bring some visitors out and be wonderful to see somebody get saved this week also good to have Tammy with us and Patty back again for a second time around. Uh, both those gals been through it. And uh, uh, Tammy's there with her pillow reminded me of uh, what Carla said about Tom Glowicki. They've been taking him around town and showing him familiar places to try to get him thinking uh, again. And when she took him by the church, he said, I got to go to that place. They love me in that place. And uh, last hey. night she took him to church, took pillows, propped him up and somehow or another he made church. Uh, so anyhow, I'd like to think that, uh, Tammy, they love you in this place, and Patty, they love you in this place, and uh, that needs to be true of each one uh, right on through. So uh, Tom said that the Lord's really working in his, working on him, uh, and he said that uh, he's going to love everybody. <laughs> and Carla says, I don't know what that means, other than that uh, Tom, he's been the type of guy, Mr. Sheriff, uh, when Tom was in this area, uh, he was the fellow, if there was any trouble in the shop, he solved the problem. And uh, he was, uh, they called him Red. Although his hair was black, they called him Red. And uh, I guess you probably don't understand why that was. But anyhow, I said, Lord's really working on him. He's going to love everybody. So I hope the Lord really works on you and myself as well tonight. Brother MacDowell preached to us. And uh, you get everything he's got for you from the Word of God. And we'll take her now. I didn't know whether Brother Art was uh, giving announcements or introducing me. I guess he was introducing me. Brother Art's really getting high tech, I, I have to say that. He's uh, got a CD player now. <laughs> he feels like he's almost gone into apostasy. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, I love somebody that's not given to change. I wish, wish I was more like that. The older I get, my wife says I, I get more stubborn, but that's because she's so stubborn that she can't see that I'm, I'm sort of bending over her way a little bit. And uh, she thinks I'm the one that's stubborn. But I'm not, I'm not stubborn. Are you stubborn? Are you stubborn? <laughs> Are you stubborn? How many of you in here are stubborn tonight? Raise your hand. Be honest. The rest of you are just lying, man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to be back tonight. and No snow and nothing to worry about. So we can just stay until we're done. And then we'll go home. But I like to be here. I'm thankful I'm here tonight. There's a lot of places I've been that uh, have not been half this nice. And I'm thankful I'm right here tonight. It's been good to listen to the hymns. And uh, I'm like Brother Art, you know, give me an old hymn book. I'm not going to shine nothing up on the wall. We're going to just take the hymn book and open it up. And one of the things I like about a hymn book is uh, a hymn book like the All-American hymn book and the one that we use down at our place, uh, you know, it, it makes a doctrinal statement. And that's why they, they want to get rid of the hymn book because you can go back in the back of your hymn book and start leafing through the index and you'll see it split up in different, uh, in different areas like salvation, 
and uh, songs about the blood and songs about the second coming and songs about um, uh, heaven. And you know what those are? Those are all things that we believe, doctrines, teachings that we believe that come out of the Word of God. And so if they want to get rid of the Bible, it's uh, quite understandable that they want to get rid of the hymn book too. And so you keep your hymn book and you keep your Bible. And um, uh, that's, uh, that's one thing that, uh, you know, by the grace of God, I'm not going to change as far as I'm concerned. I'm always going to be identified with a church that believes the Bible, that carries the Bible. Uh, down where I'm at, we even have pew Bibles for the people that are too lazy uh, to bring theirs. We have one in the back of the pew. Or in case they have the wrong Bible. And uh, sometimes people come in and they don't have the right Bible. And so um, there's a King James Bible in the back of the pew that they can pick up. And uh, they, can, they can read out of that Bible. And uh, I'm thankful that we have the, the truth, the Word of God. I'm thankful that uh, we don't have to wonder or guess about it. When I sit down to read the Bible, I've never found a mistake because I've never looked for a mistake. You know? The only person that's going to find a mistake is somebody that's going to be looking for one. And if you're looking for one, something's wrong with your heart. <laughs> you know? I mean, they told me it was the Word of God. Why should I look for a mistake in the Word of God? And uh, so I've always sat down and I've looked at the Bible and read the Bible and uh, I've never found any mistakes in it. And somebody came along one time and says, well, this is what they say is a mistake. And I looked at that and I found out that, uh, you know, it wasn't really a mistake. There was nothing wrong with it at all. It was the person that was looking at it that was making a mistake. And uh, I'm thankful God has given us his word. I hope you won't uh, hold it against me for preaching out of the book of Deuteronomy two nights in a row. But um, if you would, take your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 33, Deuteronomy 33, and keep your Bible handy, because uh, we're going to look at some scriptures tonight, and uh, we're going to uh, turn to a, a number of scriptures. Sometimes um, I quote scripture, sometimes I read it, and sometimes I ask people to turn to it. I think it always does you more uh, there, it's, it's always better when you turn to it and look at it when somebody reads it. Now, there's been times when I've been accused of not using the King James Bible because uh, my, my reading, I don't know. When Brother Art talks about these people that are having uh, strokes and, and things like that, it, it sort of scares me. You know, I'm, I'm the, the, older, the, the longer we go and the older you get, you just see uh, everybody around you, they're starting to collapse. They're starting to you know, have ailments and problems, and I know that I'm right there. If that's the case, it's not going to be long for me before I start having some problems too. But uh, there's no problems with the Bible. If I read it wrong, please forgive me. I hope God will forgive me. It's not my intention to read it wrong, but I won't wear my glasses because I'm stubborn. <laughs> but I don't know that that would even improve my reading. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 33. You ready? You all ready? You happy tonight? Amen. You glad you're here? Amen. Amen. You saved? Amen. Okay. That's a good, good way to be. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 33. It says in verse 26. Deuteronomy 33, 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency, and thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Our Heavenly Father, tonight I pray that you would bless the Word of God now to our hearts, and help us, Lord, as we look at the Scriptures, that we might understand the things that you've preserved for us here in this book. I pray, Lord, that you would help me to tell the truth tonight. I pray, Father, that the things that come out of my mouth would be the things that would help, the things that would edify, the things that would encourage. And, Lord, if rebuke is needed, the things that come out of my mouth would 
uh, do the rebuking, but Father, all according to your will. Lord, we just ask that you'd have your way in this place tonight. Lord, I ask that you would speak to our hearts and help us, Father, to draw nigh to you and go out of here with a determination to live for you the rest of the days of our life. If there's anyone in here, Lord, that's not saved tonight, I pray that you'd show them that they need to be saved. And Father, may they turn to Jesus Christ, your Son, before they leave tonight. For those, Lord, that are saved and may be following afar, I pray, God, that you would speak to their hearts and draw them close to you. Just have your way, Lord. May the Holy Spirit of God move in our midst. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In this passage that I've just read to you, Moses is getting ready to die. He gathers the tribes together and he, he uh, makes some statements about each of the tribes. And, and uh, he, he uh, talks about some things and uh, puts a blessing upon the tribes of Israel. When you get down to verse 29, he says, There's none like unto the God of Jeshurun. And he talks about the greatness of God. Verse 29 shows you that God is a great God. And then in verse 27, he says, The eternal God is thy refuge. He shows you not only is God a great God, but He is an eternal God. Eternal means uh, no, no beginning, no end. He's always, he always has been, always will be. Uh, something that is eternal is something that is hard for me to understand and conceive because uh, there's been a beginning in my life. There will be an end in my life. And I've, everything I've seen around me has a beginning and an end. But God has no beginning. He has no end. He is the eternal God. Some gods today that people gravitate to are gods that had a beginning because they made them with their hands. And gods that will have an end because they'll destroy them. But this God is a great God because He's an eternal God. No beginning, no end. And then not only that, but if you look down there in verse 28, it says that He is a saving God. He is a God that uh, uh, calls, uh, brings about salvation. He's a saving God. Uh, verse tw uh, 29, Happy are thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord. So he's a saving God. He's a great God. He's an eternal God. He's a saving God. But not only that, he's also a God that protects. He's a protecting God. Because he says, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help. I like this. I like the fact that, you know, I can, I can put my confidence in God because He's great. He's eternal. He's all around. He's every place. He's everlasting. He'll never end. He always has been, always will be. He'll protect you. He'll take care of you. He, he will save you. He'll deliver you. He's a great God. And not only that, He'll help you. Back in verse 20, uh, 26, it says, uh, Who rideth upon the heavens in thy help. He's a helping God. And then in verse uh, uh, 27 again, He's a, a God that you can flee to, that uh, you can hide in. He's a refuge. The eternal God is thy refuge. You can find safety and protection in this God. And not only that, but He'll support you. The Bible says uh, uh, there that uh, He'll take care of the enemy and He'll... Uh, watch over you and support you and take care of you in life. Now, I'll tell you what. When you have that kind of a God, you've got the right God. If you have any other kind of God tonight that you're relying in, trusting in, looking to, you have the wrong God. But the Bible, here in Deuteronomy chapter 33, shows you what kind of God the true and living God is. Now, when my boy was getting ready to go back to Iraq, I was thinking about preaching a message. And I thought, uh, this is going to be his last Sunday, and I wonder what I can preach that would be not only a help to him, but a help to the people that are going to be there. I've never uh, designed a message or never have uh, worked on a message to preach to one person. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's no the, the person might not even show up. So when I think about a message, I think, how can I help this group of people? How, what can I say that will not only help one individual, but will help every individual that comes into that building. 
And this evening, I hope that this message will be a help to you because I call this message a shield to protect. You know, one of the things that we're going to need in the year 2004 is we're going to need the protection of God. As time goes on and as things get more hectic in this country, the Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, and truly they are. Sin is on the rampage. The devil is having his heyday. Brother, I'll tell you what... Uh, those that do good are thought evil of and you're just not going to get away uh, with living for the Lord and doing right and doing good if Jesus tarries His coming. You're going to need someday some protection from the powers to be that be. And I'm not talking about the government necessarily. I'm talking about some other powers tonight. You need a shield to protect you. This year... You're going to need a shield to protect you. There's going to be some times when you're going to be in danger and not necessarily from a human enemy, a physical enemy, but you'll face a spiritual enemy every single day of the year 2004. One who can cause great damage in your life. You know why people don't think they need any protection? Because they don't know the enemy. If you knew your enemy you'd realize how much you need protection. People think about, uh, about the devil. They think, well, you know, the devil, I'm saved, and the devil doesn't have any jurisdiction over me because I'm saved. But you know, God sometimes allows the devil to do certain things. Sometimes God even gives the devil permission to do certain things. If you take your Bible and turn to Job chapter 1, uh, in Job chapter 1 and 2, uh, you'll find some great lessons about the devil. In Job chapter 1 and 2, you'll see the power of the devil manifested in the life of one man. And the reason why it's manifested in the life of that one man is because that one man, according to the Scriptures, was a perfect and upright man, a man that feared God and eschewed evil. In other words, he was right with God, he was living for God, he was doing the right thing, and God saw that and marked that man and said, that man is a great man, that man is a good man. So much so that when the devil showed up one day in the presence of God, he said, have you ever considered my servant Job? And he says, yeah, I have. But he said, Job doesn't fear you for naught. He said, Job doesn't fear you for nothing. The reason why he fears you is because you've done so much for him and plus you've put a hedge about him and you've got him protected so that I can't get into him. But if you tear down that hedge and let me have a shot at him, I'll have him curse you to your face. And God said, you're on. That's what he said. He said, you're on. Verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan... Behold, all that he has is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, and there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them. The Sabians are a group of people that the devil riled up to go against one man. I'd say that's power. When you have the power to stir up a group of people against one man, that's power. And this was in one day. In one day. Look what happens. In one day, not only did the Sabians come upon uh, uh, them and took away, yea, they have uh, uh, slain thy servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am alone, uh, escaped alone to tell thee, while he was yet speaking, while he was speaking, while this one was delivering the message, here comes another messenger. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only 
only am alone, escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, uh, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain thy servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, here comes another and another, and the devil is behind all of this. You know what that is? That's an enemy that has some power. You know whose enemy that is? That's not just Job's enemy, but that's your enemy tonight. That's the kind of power that an enemy has. Take your Bible and turn to the New Testament, to Ephesians chapter 2. Know something about your enemy. Ephesians chapter 2. I know you know this. I know you understand this. I'm just here to remind you of it. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. The Bible says, Wherein in time past ye walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all, had our conversation in time past or in in times past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others you know what the Bible says there about the devil it says he is the prince of the power of the air the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience There is a spirit that works in every man that is outside of Christ. It is not the spirit of God. It is the spirit of the prince of the power of the air. That's pretty powerful. When you can be called by God the prince of the power of the air. But not only that. Take your Bible and turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, not only is he the prince of the power of the air, but in John chapter 14, notice what it says there. Verse 30, John chapter 14 and verse 30, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world. So he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world. And lo and behold, he has another title, a lot more titles. But look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want you to read this with me. I want you to understand this tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the prince of this world. He's called the God of this world now God is in charge of everything but God has delegated some power to Satan and has let him loose for a time and right now Satan is the God of this world and he has control and if that's true and I believe it to be true with all my heart then that means you and I have an enemy. You and I have an enemy that wants to do away with us. John went back to Iraq. Over there, there's an enemy. He doesn't know who the enemy is sometimes. It's not a formidable enemy like they had in Second World War and in the First War or even in the Vietnam War. I mean, uh, this is terroristic activity over there, and it could be anyone from a woman that has uh, bombs on her body that's getting ready to blow herself up to uh, a man that are hiding out in a little hut over on the side of the road uh, with uh, 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 rockets and stuff uh, buried under the road. So when they come driving up the road, they push you a button and blow something up. That's an enemy. Uh, sometimes you don't know who that enemy is, but uh, he's over there facing a real physical enemy. You and I cannot see the enemy we're facing, but he's all around us tonight. He's in the world. He's the God of the world. The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. The Bible says that this enemy goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you can be sure of this, he wants to devour you. So you need some protection. You need a shield to protect. Now I want to say three things. Now you remember these 
to me three things about a shield. Okay? First of all, I want to say this about a shield. A shield has to be big enough to protect you. Okay? The second thing is a shield has to be strong enough to stop whatever is being thrown at you. And the third thing, and this is deep. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You. This is deep. A shield has to be between you and the enemy. Okay? Three things about a shield. It has to be big enough to protect you. It has to be strong enough to stop whatever the enemy's sending your way. And it has to be between you and the enemy. Now, first of all, I want to say this. A shield has to be big enough to protect. You know, when I was a kid and I lived outside of Philadelphia, and we lived in a town where they had these houses that were built about, I'd say about mm, 10 foot apart, 15 foot in between the houses. I mean, you could stand and lean against one house and spit and hit the other house. That's how close we were. And when it would snow, what we would do is, uh, I, um, me and my brothers, uh, we had, there was a, a next door neighbor and we were all about the same age. And, and uh, he and his sister would build a fort out of snow in their yard. And then we would build a fort out of snow in our yard. And the two forts would face each other. And then we'd, we'd get snowballs, you know, and we'd put them on shelves and have them down there. And then we'd have a snowball fight. And we would lob those snowballs over and hit each other with them. And then one somebody came up with the bright idea. Well, you know, this fort only partially protects you from the snowball. We need something else. We need some kind of a shield. And the best thing that we could find was a garbage can lid. Now, a garbage can lid had a handle right in the center. And you could hold that thing up. And so you could stand up. And when they saw you and threw their snowball, boom, you pulled the garbage can lid up. It would stop the snowball and then boom, you'd wail him. So finally, everybody in, in, in the little old town uh, on our street, when we'd have snowball fights, you'd see us walking around with those garbage can lids. <laughs> you know why? Somebody threw that boom, we'd hold that thing up. You know what? It was big enough to stop a, stop a snowball. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to go into battle with a garbage can lid. I wouldn't want to go over to Iraq with a garbage can lid and they're shooting rockets at me and they're lobbing grenades at me and I take my garbage can lid and say, ha ha, you can't hurt me. There's my garbage can lid, man, boom. They'd hit that thing and knock me out into eternity. <laughs> so if you're going to have a shield, you have to have one that's big enough to protect you from the enemy that you're facing. A garbage can lid was okay for snowballs, but it's not any good against an AK-47. It's not any good against good missiles. It's not any good against uh, um, uh, mortars or tanks firing at you. It was only good for snowballs. So if you're going to have a shield, you have to know something about your enemy. And then you have to have a shield that's big enough to protect you from that enemy. I was talking to the preacher tonight. He told me Jake Sinoreski had passed away. Jake Sinoreski used to work down in the, the Correctional Institute down in Lucasville. And uh, one of his jobs down there, he was a big man, as you well know. And so one of his jobs is when a prisoner would get unruly. And they had some big men in there. I mean, all they did was eight hours a day sit around and, and pump uh, iron, you know, and build up their muscles. And, and some of them would get uh, kind of wild. And, and they'd been in the institution for a long time. And they'd get rebellious. And sometimes they'd just start going crazy. I mean, they'd tear their mattress up and set it on fire. And they'd throw stuff out through the bars. And sometimes Jake would have to go in. And they'd have to take one of these prisoners and take them out. And so what they did is they gave Jake the shield. He was the shield man. And he had a shield, and, and he's a big man. He had a shield that he could put his arms through like that and then grab right there in the center. And they would, the guards would open the door, and Jake would be the first one through the door. And he would just run toward that prisoner, and there would be two or three fellows following him in, and they'd have mace, and they'd have uh, nightsticks, and, and uh, Jake would run. He said the best, the best technique was to run, hit the guy, and put the shield up under his chin like that and just lift him right up off the ground and hold him there until they could get him handcuffed and in submission. Even though he was a big man, you know what he needed to protect him when he went into that cell? He needed a shield. And they gave him that shield. I've seen these guys that go out into, into riot areas. They have their riot gear on. They have their hats and, and they have the plastic visor that comes down and then they have the shield. 
And when the rocks and bottles start coming in, they hold up the shield. There's an enemy and there's a shield. But the shield has to be big enough to protect you from your enemy. Not only that, number two, you ready? The shield has to be strong enough to stop whatever's coming in. So you have to know what your enemy's using. Might be bullets, might be bombs, might be fiery darts. That's what my Bible says. Fiery darts that come from the devil. They have a new they have a new type of material they call Kevlar. They make these vests. They put these Kevlar panels in there, and that is supposed to stop a bullet, supposed to stop shrapnel. You know what John told me when he came home? He said, Dad, they give us the vest, but they don't give us the, the inserts, the plates that go in it. All just starting to catch up with the Bible. I heard a few days ago, the army is issuing a dog tag. It has the on the other side. It has Joshua one nine. They call it the shield of faith dog tag. So now a serviceman can wear his identification dog tag, and the other called the shield of faith with the American flag and Joshua one nine on it. Because brother, I'll tell you what: the army's starting to catch up with the Bible and realizing that if the Lord doesn't take care of you, brother, you don't have anybody to take care of you. He's a shield. You can face danger. Joshua didn't know what to expect. But God said, you don't have to worry because I'm with you. And I'm going to be there. And you and be of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Don't be dismayed. Don't worry about the enemy. Don't worry about the size of the enemy. Don't worry about how the odds look. Just go out and do what you're supposed to do. Because I'm going to take care of you. He's the shield. David was a warrior king. He was a fighting king. He never lost any wars. When the enemy would come up against David, he would go out against that enemy and he would fight that enemy. The first time he ever went out against the enemy, he was a young man. And there was a seasoned veteran that had the ranks of Israel hovering in the trenches in fear. And he would strut out there day after day and march up and down on the side of that hill and challenge the armies of Israel to send a man out to fight him. And no one would go out to fight him. The king wouldn't fight him. None of the men in the army of Saul would go out and fight Goliath, that great giant warrior. One day David came along and he said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the army of the living God? I'll go out and fight him. And when David went out and stood against that giant, just a young boy, the giant had a shield, he had a sword, and he had a spear. But you see, his shield wasn't big enough It wasn't strong enough, and it wasn't between him and his enemy, which was God. And God directed that stone like a missile right between the eyes of Goliath, and he toppled like a domino. David said, let me tell you something. I have found out that I've got a shield, and he's the Lord. And in Psalm chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. In Psalm 28 and verse 7, he says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In Psalm 33 and verse 20, Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Psalm 91 and verse 7, it says, A thousand shall fall at thy right side and ten, or at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh to thee. David knew something when he, as a warrior king, went into battle. The Lord was his shield. The Lord was his protector. The Lord was going to bring him back safely. And the one time 
that he didn't put the shield between him and the enemy was a time when kings go forth to battle. And David stayed back. And the enemy got between him and the shield. And oh, what a dark day in David's life. A day that caused him many sorrows, many tears, and almost put him completely out of the action. The Lord, the Lord's your shield. I can face the trials of life, the afflictions of life, the setbacks of life, the hardships of life, as long as I have my shield. And as long as that shield is between me and my enemy, because he's big enough and he's strong enough to protect me. The second thing that is the shield, and you've already guessed it, it's the Word of God. This book is a shield. Take your Bible and go over to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. And in Proverbs chapter 30, I love this passage of Scripture. It's an amazing passage of Scripture to me. Always has been. It's yielded a lot of truth. It says in verse 4, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Well, that's obvious. It's only one that can do that. That's God. That's the Lord. It says, Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Well, that's pretty obvious. Only the Lord can gather the wind in his fist. Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Again, it's pretty obvious, the God of creation that does all this. Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And I like this. And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? I don't know how a Jew can read that and answer... The first questions in that verse, God, 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 God. What is his name? Jehovah. What is his son's name? Jesus. That's his son's name. Jesus. What does it say? It says, every word of God is pure. He. He. He is a shield. Unto them that put their trust in Him. The Word of God and Jesus Christ are synonymous. He is the Word incarnate. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And He's the shield. When I pick this thing up, when I have this thing, I have a shield. It's big enough. It's strong enough. It's been time-tested and proven. And you can put it between you and your enemy. And when Jesus was on this earth, and the enemy that you have, he had. And he had to defeat that enemy, and he did at the cross. But he was also tempted by that enemy. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, you can read the accounts. And you know what he used on that enemy? He used this shield right here. And he said, As it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he put the shield between him and his enemy. You know what I have in this book? I have a shield that can protect me against everything that the devil tries to throw at me. Take your Bible and go back to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua's already been told now that the Lord is going to go with him, be there for him. He had the promise, but now he gets the appearance. <laughs> and in jo Joshua chapter 5, it says on, in verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord of hosts, 
am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith? What saith? Here's a man that's standing there with a sword in his hand. And he didn't say, What are you going to do? Or how are you going to do it? He said, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. I can't help but think that when I open this book right here, that I get on holy ground, and I'm looking at this thing saying, Okay, Lord, what do you say? What do you say? I want to know what you're saying. Everything that I think about, every problem that I'm faced with, everything that I study, everything that I try to learn, you know what I do? I go to this book and I say, okay, God, what do you say about it? And if I can't find out what God says about it, then I say, I don't know. But if I can go to this book and I can find the basis of a truth out here in this world, in the pages of this book, I say, that's okay. That will work because I can find it right here. But if I can't find it right here, I say, it is never going to work. It's not going to work. You know, those of you that are raising families, a lot of books out there about how to raise your family. But I'll tell you what, this is the book right here. You say, well, what if I raise my family according to this book and then they don't come out the right way? Doesn't matter. I'll tell you why it doesn't matter. Because they've got something in them that they're never going to be able to get away from, that they're going to wrestle with all their life, something that God will use on them day after day after day after day. And brother, I'll tell you what, if you raise them some other way, they'll go out there and they'll never have that. They'll go out and live their life and do their thing. They might have some little philosophy that you've embedded in them. But if they've got this embedded in them, it'll always come to the surface. No matter where they're at or what they're doing, it'll always come to the surface. And they'll have to deal with it. Because this book and Jesus are synonymous. And the Lord's a shield. And this book is a shield. The Bible is like fire. Jeremiah found that out. He said, I got it in me. And I said, I was going to keep my mouth shut. And it was burning me up. And I couldn't stand it. And I had to open my mouth and get it out. It's like a sword. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, it's the sword of the Spirit. You can stand against the strongest enemy if you have this. It's like a hammer. It can take and it can pound on you and beat on you until you realize that it's right and it's the right way. But it's also a shield. A shield that you can hold up. A shield that can keep the devil off your back and keep him from devouring you. Psalm 119. If you would turn there, Psalm 119. I want you to see this one verse. Verse 113 says, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. David realized that the Lord was his shield. David realized that the word was his shield. And the same shield that David had that got him through the battles of life you have tonight. The last thing. That's the shield of faith. In Ephesians chapter 6, and I'll read this. If you want to turn over there, this will be the next to the last scripture that we'll look at tonight. But in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talks about the soldier. And he talks about the armor. And he gets down to verse 16 and he says, Above all. Above all, taking the shield of faith, 
wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, that's a pretty important shield. The shield of faith. That's the only time that the word shield is mentioned in the New Testament. When I looked up the word shield in the Old Testament, you know, it said uh, something that would protect you and something that would uh, keep you safe and things like that. But when I went and looked at this word in the concordance, it said it's a door. It's like a door that stands between you and the adversary. You know, a door is something you can open. A door is something that can be opened. But the shield of faith, it says here, quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. And it's the shield of faith. The shield of faith. That's a big shield. The Bible says faith is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Think of all the things that can be done by faith. If the shield of faith is a door, and that door can be opened, then the Lord is able to open by faith opportunities for you to stand, to fight, to witness, to be a soldier, and do the things that He's left you here to do. When I think of the things that can be done by faith, I think of prayer. I think of praying. By faith, I can pray for my son over in Iraq, and I can pray every day, and I can say, God, keep him safe when he sleeps, keep him safe when he's awake, protect him, shield him about, cover him up, be a refuge to him, give him courage, give him strength, give him stamina, make him brave, keep him strong in the face of the enemy. I pray that day after day after day. And you know what I believe? I believe God is going to do that. I believe God hears. When we pray, He hears. Whether it's an audible prayer that comes out of our mouth or a prayer that's said from the depths of our heart, I believe God hears that prayer. I believe this. God answers all of our prayers. Every one. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's wait. But He answers all of our prayers. And when we pray, if we don't pray in faith believing, then we're not really praying. Praying is something that is done by faith. I believe that people are saved by faith. They believe on Jesus Christ. They come to the place in their life where they realize they're a sinner, that they're wicked, that they're ungodly. And you know, I'll tell you what, when I deal with somebody, I don't tiptoe around. I make them tell me that they're wicked because there's no such thing as a good sinner. We're all bad sinners. We're all ungodly. I know we don't like to hear it, but we are without God. We're ungodly till we come to the Savior. We're wicked. We're, we're by nature a children of disobedience and the spirit uh, of the prince of the power of air works in us until we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. When that person gets saved, they get saved because they come to the realization and to the heart belief that they have no hope whatsoever unless Jesus Christ saves them and they turn to Him. That's repentance right there. They turn to Him and they say, Lord, save me. You're the only one that can do it. I believe in you. I believe you died for me on the cross, that you were buried, that you rose again the third day, and that when you died, you died for my sin, and you raised victorious over sin, over death, over hell, and over the grave, and I'm turning to you and asking you to be my Savior. And brother, I'll tell you what, salvation comes instantly to that individual. Why? Because they have believed on Jesus Christ. I believe that by faith mountains are moved. That's what Jesus said. He said, if you have faith, as of a grain of mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be thou removed and it'll be cast into the sea. You say, I haven't seen any mountains move. Maybe you better do a little faith check. I've seen a lot of mountains move in 37 years. You say, well, that faith isn't going to stop a bullet. That faith isn't going to stop a physical enemy from tearing you up. Hebrews 11. 
and we'll stop here. Hebrews 11. Down to the end. It says in verse 32, And what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised again to life, to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And let me tell you something, faith will do a lot of things. And that Bible tells you, as a Christian, that you're to put on the whole armor of God, and above all, above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby you can quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Now, you have an adversary, you know who he is. You have an adversary, you know his tactics. You have an adversary, you know what he's trying to do to your life. Now, you have a shield to protect you. Are you going to put the protection on him? Are you going to take up the shield? Are you going to go out of here, face the year 2004, secure with the armor God has given you and the shield God has given you? I hope you do. Because as time goes on, you're going to need a shield to protect. A stand for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, I pray that you could speak to our hearts. Lord, I don't know what these folks are up against. I don't know what they're going to be facing next week, next month, next six months. Lord, only you know that. But, Father, I'm so thankful that, that you're there as a shield, that the Word is there as a shield, and that faith, the shield of faith is there to quench all the fiery darts that the wicked will hurl at us. Now, God, help us to put on the armor and take up the equipment, take up the shield, stand with the sword of the Spirit in our hand. And, Lord, we might not have a physical enemy tonight that wants to kill us physically. Maybe we do and don't even know it. But, Lord, we certainly know that we have a spiritual enemy that would like to knock us out, put us out of commission, keep us from being effective, keep us from being a witness, keep us from growing, and keep us from doing anything for you. Help us, Lord, to stand against that enemy and protect us with your power, with your shield. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing an invitation hymn tonight. What will it be? Page 382. Page 382. God spoke to your heart and you need to come. You come as we sing. Some of you young people in here tonight, you're just starting out on the road to life. You don't even know some of the snags and pitfalls and some of the temptations. You're not even aware of some of it right now. But one of these days, you're going to become very aware of it and hopefully not too late. But if you take the shields right now if you make sure that the Lord is your shield he can keep the bad stuff away from you he can keep the bad people away from you the bad influences away from you 
but you're going to have to put the shield between you and the enemy. And if you don't, you will fall. If I was young again, I'd make sure I saved. I'd make sure I sold out. And I'd make sure that the Lord was my shield. If I knew everything I know now. You don't have to experience the wrong things of life. To understand them. You can take somebody else's word for it. Just take a look around and look at the heartbreak and the misery. And then say, God, I want you to be my shield. And I want you to protect me against that adversary. Because he wants to waylay you in the worst way. Think about it, young people. Think about it, moms and dads. You need a shield. We all need the shield. You need the shield tonight. We're going to sing another verse. If God spoke to your heart, you need to come. Don't stand back there and say, well... We'll be over in just a few minutes. Don't be stubborn. Don't be stubborn against the Lord. I'm a stubborn man, but I'm not stubborn against God. Man, He can drop me in a second. He can drop me in a heartbeat. I'm not stubborn against Him. If God has spoke to your heart tonight and you need to come, don't wait another second. Just bail out. Come on up here. Pray. Get some things straightened out. You'll go out of here happy. And you'll go out of here with some protection. Let's sing on the next verse. If God spoke to your heart. You need to come. You come as we sing. Make sure you use them. That ought to keep you pretty safe. Keep you in pretty good shape here uh, between now and the rapture. Let's bow our heads now for the closing prayer. And Brother John Evans, if you would.